Just a couple of things uh, perhaps we'll get to a little later in the program. Uh, number one, this morning, uh, Fox is reporting that any day now there could be a decision on Bo Bergdahl's future. Hope to get to that a little later in the program. Also, Steve Millington will be joining us in about 25 minutes. He's the chairman of the Twin Falls County Republican Party. A lot to talk about today. Of course, the House of Representatives still in flux as they're looking for a new majority leader and a lot of names being bandied about, and perhaps he'll have some insight into all of that. Seven minutes after 8 o'clock, Bill Cahalli with you this morning on Top Story 49. You're listening to News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Came across a couple of headlines this morning, and I thought they were worth sharing because of an ongoing controversy right here in our own community. And we have been we have been hearing the stories about refugees and migrants now going on for at least, oh golly, six months. All the way back into last spring. Now we're we're practically into mid October. October was the arrival date for many of these refugees. I am sure that 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 is going to be kept under wraps. There will likely not be a giant parade coming through town introducing all of these people when they arrive if they have have not yet already arrived. And and that's something that very very likely or very very possible. Came across this headline out of North Dakota, which is a, a state similar to Idaho, a little colder I suppose, over uh, over average because the state uh, most of it sits that far to the north where parts of Idaho, of course, here in the southern end of the state a little bit warmer than the northern end, but very, very similar. And the headline at a, at a blog there called SayAnythingBlog.com, which is written by a fellow named Rob, uh, Rob Port. Uh, Rob Port is a former sidekick to Scott Heenan. Scott Heenan is a frequent fill-in for Sean Hannity on the radio, and Rob Port is a lifetime resident of North Dakota. Uh, I don't know why he'd want to do that, but apparently he does like it. Some things you just can't explain. They're inexplicable, right? But Rob Port has this today. He says, why we need transparency. North Dakota leads the nation in per capita refugee resettlement. Now, you've got a lot of rural states, Idaho, North Dakota. You've got places such as South Carolina. You've got places such as Maine that seem to be the dumping ground for this program, at least in recent years. Here's what he's saying, and he's got a quote here. We're reaching out and trying to help our neighbors. That from the mayor of Fargo, North Dakota, in response to news that North Dakota does lead the nation when it comes to resettlement. He went on to say, we have jobs, we have needs, and we're trying to grow as a state. So another mayor who was uh, clapping his hands saying, got to be good, got to be good, got to be good, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. But skepticism in the public persists, the writer says, and the reason for that is the staunch unwillingness by Lutheran Social Services and its supporters to put some facts out about how these refugees behave once they reach here. In fact, it seems Lutheran Social Services defenders would rather call skeptics xenophobes and racists than have a deal or a real discussion about their concerns. Does that sound at all familiar? Does that sound because because here that's the situation too, isn't it? No one really wants to talk about potential dark side of all of this. We keep being told, no, it's not going to cost much money, and no, oh, no, they won't use up much in the way of social services. Well, they're using more of social services than before they got here, when you look at the entire social services budget, right? So we've got to bring that part up, too, as well. In other words, they will not release to the public the details and the facts about these people who come here, which you can probably track over a period of six months to a year to six years. He also says this. And North Dakota, if you're geographically challenged, and I know some of you public school graduates are, North Dakota is just west of Minnesota, at least part of Minnesota. He writes, Meanwhile, it turns out Minnesota has become the largest source for ISIS recruiting in America, and the demographic the extremist recruiters are pulling from is Somali refugees. One needn't be a racist or a xenophobe to see that as a very real concern. Hello? And then the very liberal Los Angeles Times, and it is a very liberal newspaper, has this editorial. Are Islamic State terrorists sneaking into the West? Now remember, liberal op-ed page. The writer says Lebanon's education minister, Elias Boussab, warned recently that two in every 100 Syrian migrants arriving in Europe are Islamic State fighters sent to infiltrate a continent distracted by sympathy. If his estimate is accurate, it would mean that among the 10,000 Syrian refugees the Secretary of State, John Kerry, has pledged to allow into the U.S. next year, there could be 200 committed terrorists. 
Of course, those who require refuge must be aided, but the West can best help by flexing its considerable military muscle. Many Western leaders appear so self-satisfied with answering the call for refuge that they have fooled themselves into believing that their largesse provides a genuine solution. Again, the very liberal Los Angeles Times, that's on the editorial pages. Found that this morning as I was doing a little research for the program. So here you have it. You have people in North Dakota who can't get answers about the program. Oh, it's a secret. We told you yesterday the American public is overwhelmingly opposed to all of this. Here we're supposed to have a majority rule. Well, apparently that's going to be ignored. To heck with the public. To heck with public opinion. And now you have the possibility, and it's being stated in a very liberal newspaper, that yes, indeed, there will be terrorists. Now, you know that Lefty is out there saying, well, that's an acceptable loss. Compare that with a shooting, for instance, in Oregon the other day, where Lefty would say, well, we need to take everybody's guns away because just one death is too many. Really? And what about a terrorist attack? Is that okay? I mean, does that, can, you, can you use the same argument that one death would be too many? What is the problem with all of you people on the far left who can't process that? I know it makes you feel good about yourselves, and you can walk around the streets, pat yourselves on the back, and say, I was for bringing these people here. Look at me. But I'll tell you what. If you bring a plague here along the lines of someone pulling off a dastardly deed, then I think you're going to have to answer to the rest of us. It's 50. Bill Colley with you this morning on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Our telephone number, if you'd like to reach the program, 736-0300. That is 736-0300. We have our first caller of the morning. You're up next. All right, good morning. I don't have a problem with the, uh, with the immigrants. It is the people that are uh, bringing in the immigrants I have a problem with in that I think we should, uh, we should look at um, receiving the same services that the immigrants are going to, that the refugees are receiving. However, you call your attorney, which uh, offers free pro bono services and whatnot to the refugees, and all of a sudden you're billed for his time. Yeah. <laughs> I, just, I just want the same, I want the same benefits that the refugees are receiving because I'm the one and we are the ones that are paying for those services. And, you know, I hear people all the time talk about Americans who are on uh, on the dole, and, and we complain about that. But you know what? Well, thanks for the call. I'd, I'd much rather be taking care of my fellow Americans at this moment, some of whom, I confess, are very much in need. We had this conversation yesterday because of what happened in Lewiston, Maine, and I shared some of those details on the air. The elderly, and, of course, we mentioned veterans, they are not getting what they need in this country, especially our wounded warriors. What is the problem with the left? Do they, do they despise their own countrymen? Are you going to try to tell me that, well, those people have already gotten their reward? Ha, ha, ha. He got his leg shot off at war. He got his reward. Ha, 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 ha. You're full of baloney. It's the same story in Europe where the elites continue to try to cram this down a, a, a public throat, a collective public throat, the public doesn't want it, but they're told you've got to do it because it'll make us look better. The public relations ploy is what it is. There's a fellow, his name is Tusk. That's his last name. It's a strange name, I know, but he is the leader of the European Council. And he was recommending during remarks early today that, that his countries and his, or his, his country and neighboring countries in Europe should be doing much, much more. There are countries which virtually do not admit any refugees, but are most vocal when it comes to urging Europe to show more openness. That is why we have to take care of our good name together. Our good name together. So this isn't really a worry about anything security-wise. It's about protecting Europe's good name. It is all about public relations, is what he's saying. Europe is subject to an increasingly more scathing criticism. And our internal disagreements and mutual recriminations only help our opponents. And your opponents are what? They're going to say bad things about you? Europe won't take refugees. That's not nice. That, is that what they're worried about? 
In other words, we have to take all of these refugees because some nebulous opponent will applaud us instead of criticizing us? Wow, the Western world used to win world wars. Uh, and today, you've got these people groveling every time they, they're, they're faced with any sort of challenge. You're up next. You're on the air on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. What's on your mind? Yeah, good morning, Bill. Well, another aspect of it is invasion. In Article 4, Section 4 of the U.S. Constitution, are all of our politicians, state and local and, and federal, take an oath to uphold the U.S. Constitution. Article 4, Section 4 said they're to protect us from invasion. It doesn't say an invading army. But we have an army invading us with all these Muslims, whether they're jihadist or not. And they're taking over Europe without firing a shot. And the same thing's happening here. The other aspect that concerns me is we have people, huge unemployment, huge national debt, and we can't afford to bring these people in because a lot of our people are not getting jobs because these people work for less money. And a lot of times there are subsidies that go to the employees or employers in this situation. So I'd like to bring that up too. Article 4, Section 4, look it up. And our elected officials need to be reminded to protect us against invasion. Not only jihad invasion with um, terrorists, but these people that are coming here by the mass numbers and the number that the White House is State Department's wanting to bring in will be an invasion. It's already happening. Yeah, and I thank you much for the call. The, the, the issue with the Constitution is try to find somebody in government who actually pays attention to it. I remember years ago, I was at a, that there was a constitutional attorney. who That was her specialty. She was running for a congressional seat. I was at a forum at a firehouse when someone stood up and said, name the five liberties guaranteed in the First Amendment, and she couldn't do it. So... You know, they, they just, it's again, it's about what makes them feel good. When they go out of the cocktail party circuit, someone will pat them on the back and tell them, oh, what a wonderful thing you did, you know, and it's a good thing we silenced all those dumb, dumb dummies among the rabble. That's what it's come down to. And our caller brings up another point. If I get to it later this morning, I'll share with you details on a story I happen to find from an economist that the, uh, the corporate earnings have dropped for three consecutive quarters in this country. The last time it dropped two consecutive quarters was back when we had the recession, 2008-2009, which you may remember was just brutal and we haven't recovered from it yet. So I bring this up because I think it's important for people to know that there's going to be tremendous competition for resources out there. And the government doesn't necessarily have the ability any longer to bring us out of the depths of a recession, whether or not it's its responsibility in the first place. And you'd like to bring more people here to beg on the streets? Somehow I'm not buying into this, and I certainly don't see the logic. It's 820. Bill Colley with you this morning on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. It's 49. Hey, quick note uh, coming up just a moment. There are a lot of people who, who well, I think that, that, that it's like the second largest ethnic group in America when it comes to ancestry. It, you can fudge that a little bit because a lot of people who come from uh, what are known as the British Isles, you know, the, the, you've got three or four different ethnic groups there, or so they claim. They're all actually really cousins. But uh, Germany was pretty much at one point, you know, the mother country being England, but when it comes to Germans, German settlers, when they started arriving in large numbers in the late 1700s and then really started pouring into Pennsylvania and other places around the country and then spread out across the land into Missouri and the Midwest and then into the Northwest, uh, really brought that culture with them. I've got a guest today who's going to be talking a little bit about that. It's 823, it's 49. Ray Parrish is dropping by. I haven't seen you in the studio for a few months now. It's been a while, Bill. Yeah, because we were talking Cincinnati Bengals football the last time you were here. <laughs> yes, it's true. You'd have, to be, you'd have to be above 50 to know that reference. <laughs> 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 but you're here representing the Kiwanis Club today. I am. We're having uh, our big fundraiser tomorrow night, Wednesday night, at the Turf Club. It's our annual October feast dinner, and it's the most authentic German dinner in the Valley. I was going to say, when you're talking German food, there's going to be obviously sauerkraut on that menu. There is, but it's a special sauerkraut. It's, ah. it's got a uh, pineapple, brown sugar, caraway seed mix. And when we first started this about 15, 20 years ago, Bill, uh, the one thing that came back 
and hit the garbage dump the most was the sauerkraut. And the last two years, we've almost run out. Really? Because we made this little tweak. Uh, we've added the pineapple and the brown sugar and the caraway seeds, and uh, it, people really, really like it. Although I would, I would assume there's a great many ways you could prepare sauerkraut. Yes, this is a uh, both the sauerkraut and the what's called rotkohl, uh, red cabbage dish, are are two recipes that we've brought back from Germany, and uh, tweaked just a little bit, but uh, that people really like them. I would imagine the Germans imported the the, the pineapple themselves. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's grown in southern Germany, yes. the Bavarian area. Yeah, down, yeah. <laughs> Bowie Kuhn, uh, his family was from there. Oh. Do you know why I know that? Because my grandmother, Kali, that's her maiden name, and I met Bowie Kuhn on his 76th birthday at a political fundraiser, and we started comparing notes about families and the like, and he said, oh, my ancestors are all from Bavaria. I've never been there, but I would imagine, I mean, I've seen the pictures on TV. It's got to be breathtaking. Oh, it is. Uh, we can bring a little of that here, though, when we have this celebration. Uh, it's maybe, maybe you're not climbing a mountain, but you know, at least you get some feel for what it's like. Oh, we do. We do. We try and make it as authentic as possible. We used to have a, a German band uh, that came in with their lederhosen and things, but unfortunately the band broke up here about uh, two years ago, and so we don't have that. But uh, we've got some CDs with some really good uh, beer hall music, and I know I get... Uh, criticized by my fellow Kulanians because when I get in there and I crank that baby up to beer hall <laughs> volume, uh, they get a little irritated. <laughs> this is this is going to benefit someone, though, as well, right? Yes, this is our largest fundraiser. Kiwanis is a service organization, and we serve the youth of the Twin Falls area. And so this allows us to get funds to be able to help our key clubs, which are mm -hmm. service and leadership uh, groups in the Twin Falls, Kimberly, and Canyon Ridge High Schools. Uh, we do... Boy State, Girl State, we help the Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. Uh, basically, any group that is youth-focused can come to Kiwanis and ask uh, for help and assistance in what they do. How do people go about uh, getting tickets for this event tomorrow? Uh, they can get them uh, at DL Evans Bank, that's where mm -hmm. I work, uh, or they can pick them up at the door tomorrow night, and it goes from 4.30 till 8. What's And what's the cost for a, an event like this? The, the cost is $9 for adults, seniors can get in, for uh, seven dollars, uh, if they come before six, families can get in for twenty-five dollars. I was going to say there was a there was a Basque dinner in Gooding last Friday night, and I think it was more expensive than this event. So uh, this is uh, you'd call this very affordable. Oh, very, and it's you get uh, bratwurst from Falls Brand, you get uh, rote coal and the sauerkraut. Uh, we have uh, boiled potatoes, a little, little bit Irish in there, I guess. Yeah, uh, and then a roll <laughs> and ice cream for dessert. Uh, soft drinks come with the meal, and if you want beer or wine, that's available. I was going to say, uh, when when you mentioned the music earlier, I went to a. I, I used to live near a Budweiser brewery. In fact, my college roommate. It was probably a mile from his house, and they, they would help sponsor a large Oktoberfest every year. We went one year when there was a terrible rainstorm, but they had huge tents up, and we went to hear a lot of the bands that were playing, even on a rainy night. There's something very upbeat about the music that accompanies oh. this. Very. It's very upbeat. It's high tempo. Uh, you know, a lot of people refer to them as um papa bands, but uh, you, it's very, very festive mood when you're there. I was going to say, I, uh, I remember there was a Pink Panther movie where Peter Sellers attends one of these things, <laughs> and it was just raucous with tables and, you know, the beer maids and everything else uh, in the scene of the movie. Yeah, now, there were a little more uh, subdued. We have uh, <laughs> our, our key club kids from our, the high schools uh, bus our tables and, and bring your food to you. Uh, and so it's a little more uh, demure than that. They, they learn a little bit about service then too that way. They do really well. And it gives us a chance as Kiwanians, uh, adults, to be able to intermix with these youth in the high schools. And it really makes for a great opportunity. Now, are you going to be wearing that tomorrow night? I will be. I'll, uh, this is this is radio, but you know, <laughs> give you an idea. He looks like he's ready for this. I uh, cooked the bratwurst behind uh, the turf club <laughs> uh, over a big, it's a 55-gallon barrel that's cut in half. It's over charcoal. And so I'm back there. Grilling up the brats and getting them ready. I was going to say, uh, when you're doing something like that, I remember doing an event years ago when we, we were running out of food and one of our organizers owned a watermelon farm. So he, he called the farm and they sent over a truckload and we spent the remainder of that evening with him out back slicing up watermelon for everyone. <laughs> but he loved every minute of it. I mean, it's just, it's it, because even when you're working during something like this, you get caught up in the emotion of oh, it. Oh, you do. It's fun. It is really fun. And the public has been great to support us in this. And uh, we really appreciate them coming out. So again, tomorrow night, starting at 4.30. 4.30 to 8 at the Turf Club. 
and uh, we'd love to have everybody show up. Easy to find. My tax preparer is about a block away from there, <laughs> so <laughs> know the neighborhood well. Again, thank you for coming by. That's looking dunk. Oh, my gosh. He was prepared. I was going to say, if you saw the hat, too, um, he had to go far and wide to find that. We've got 8.30 coming up. Steve Millington, too, in just a couple of minutes. I want to thank Ray Parrish for coming by from the Kiwanis Club. It's 50. Bill Colley with you, too, on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com.